This past week, a case was brought to the Supreme Court regarding abortion. The goal of the, 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 the pro-life people is that the states would be given the right to make their own decisions about how <coughs> abortion should be regulated. It seems that with the federal edicts, anything goes. And it's not everything that we would hope for, but it would begin a process allowing us to be more pro-life, at least in the states that had the uh, people that wanted to do that. Now, I'm not going to hold my breath. Matter of fact, I believe they may have already voted and made the decision, but we're not going to hear about it till June. That's because that's the way the government works, slowly. But it does do damage along the way, and we see with some of these things. If you're still waiting for um, prayer to be brought back into schools and Bible reading to be brought back to schools the way it once was, you probably have a long wait. And yet, they got the laws changed to the point where if you have after school programs at your school, you cannot discriminate against a religious organization from having a program in the school along with all the other things. It's not in school, it's after school. And praise the Lord, we have had uh, CEF missionaries living in our parsonage that help start those and have them all over the valley. It's exciting. Maybe we can't get kids to come to the church, but we can go reach them there. And if you remember a couple weeks ago, find my notes here. The uh, Betty asked you to write down on a card and she uh, just notes of encouragement because hey teachers unions and teachers have been taking it on the chin for the last two years haven't they? Instead of complaining about them and saying they're the worst maybe we should be praying for them and encouraging them and that's what we sought to do. Uh, the school where we have that where we participate with that after school club and I just want you to see the next one that this is a card that they wrote. I think we already received one a thank you from somebody directly, but then the, the teachers got together and wrote this card. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things there. Thank you for the thoughtful card and the gift card. I'm skipping that large one there. Down at the bottom on the, your left, it says, uh, the kind words were uplifting and greatly appreciated. Top right, thank you for the kind words and generous gift. Uh, next below that, your kindness, uh, for the gift card and your kindness, it truly made my day. Thank you for the inspirational notes and generous gift. Thank you for the generous gift card and uplifting words. Your act of kindness made my day. Uh, thank you for your heartfelt words. The bottom there is always a pleasure having the after school club. Thank you for your generosity. Just, it just, they sound excited. Now this one that I'm gonna read, I think this is a fellow believer. You can listen, thank you for your prayer. Thank you for your prayers and for bringing Christ into the lives of children at Abona Elementary. Thank you for the generous gift cards. You touched our hearts and we truly appreciated your thoughtfulness. See, we can complain about the fact that prayer was taken out of school, Bible reading was taken out of school, or we can take the avenues that God opens up for us. And you've heard me say, even though five years after Bible reading or four years after Bible reading was taken out of school, no, I have to add, at that six to that, 11 years after. My sixth grade teacher was a retired pastor, and he read to us from a children's Bible every, probably in protest. <laughs> uh, but it was a small school no one knew about, and he was retired already, and he said, if they fire me, big deal. I'm just gonna keep doing it. So I, I was, that meant something to me, to hear him read from that children's Bible every morning before we started our day. So we, we gotta be sure that we're not just waiting for something that may never happen. We have to say, I'm waiting upon the Lord. I'm waiting upon the Lord to show me what he wants to do. And it may be totally different than what, that we're, hope, what we're hoping for. Well, as we celebrate the second Sunday of Advent, last week we re talked about hope. Hope is not an easy thing, because the very fact that you have hope means you don't have what you're hoping for. So that, that, that can grate on you. Like I'm, not, uh, I'm looking for a break of things breaking down around my house and it doesn't seem to happen. You know, things keep breaking. Um, and, and so, but I still have hope. I have to find that hope. Well, how do we, I prayed about it earlier. If our hope isn't growing, it's probably declining. It's not something that's gonna just stay put. You gotta be feeding it. And I think this, today we're gonna be talking about how do we grow our, grow hope? We do it by growing our faith. 
Now, faith isn't usually one of the themes of the Advent wreath, but I'm adding it this year. Uh, I just liked it because of some of these things that we've been studying or will be studying. We grow our faith through what? The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. As our faith grows, we wait upon the Lord and then our hope can grow. That's, that's the place where we're going. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth. And as we did last week, I've got a video to show you a little bit about their story. What do you mean you can't speak? You can put that down and talk to me, Zachariah. You went to the temple to burn incense, and now you can't speak. Because oh, you doubt. What does that even mean? You doubted what an angel told you. Now it's all making sense. <laughs> Are you feeling all right? Huh? Maybe you should sit down. Oh, I should sit down. Listen, whatever game you're playing, I really wanted to stop, Zachariah. It isn't funny. This isn't funny, Zachariah. An angel told you this. The angel said that our prayers have been heard. That you, my love, will bear a son. joy and gladness, and that many will rejoice at his birth. <laughs> he will be like Elisha. He will prepare our people for the Lord. As I was studying through Luke 1, I became very aware that Elizabeth and Zachariah were, were not the only ones waiting for something. And that's where the theme started to grow. My proposition this morning is our hope grows as we wait upon the Lord in faith. And that's what I hope we can learn a little bit about this morning. Let me go to the Lord in prayer before we open up Luke chapter 1 together. Father, I thank you. I thank you that everyone has a story to tell and you're writing everyone's story and some go through life kicking against you the whole way others submit to you but still kick again from time to time and the ones that find the greatest hope and joy 
are the ones that surrender to you completely. Help us to see that this Christmas season and learn that you do mighty things and that we can wait upon you and not get so enamored with what we think we want, but we'll be open for what you want to do in our lives. Have mercy on me, a man of unclean lips, a man uh, struggling with so many things that uh, in my own waiting, and I pray that I don't get in the way of your message today, that your spirit would be free to move in our lives. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Our hope grows as we wait upon the Lord in faith. The first people that I see waiting is a whole nation. A nation is waiting. It says in the first part of verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. Why would they be waiting? Herod was not a good guy. But he's not the worst of the problems. What we see at the end of the Old Testament is a warning from Malachi. Malachi's warning uh, was pr prophesied 430 years be before Christ. And this is what it says. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of their children to their fathers lest they come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. I love the fact that the last words God was going to speak for over 400 years was, get your families right. Families are the building block of society. And in the 9 o'clock hour, uh, Jeff was sharing about how he's learned to see how Genesis is the foundation of everything. You get Genesis wrong, everything starts to fall apart. So one of the first things God gave his human beings, his creation, was relationship. And those relationships are supposed to breed more relationships. So if the fathers are not turning toward the children, and the children turning to the fathers, did you read the Daily Bread on Saturday? I'm running around with this 22-year-old whippersnapper and trying to keep up with him, and, and I read, in the, read the Daily Bread from yesterday about the generations. How a, a, an environmentalist, when he was young, said, don't trust anybody over 30. And then he got to be over 30 and realized that wasn't good advice. The fact is, we have much to learn from the coming generation. And hopefully they know that they have much to learn from us. We have to turn our hearts toward one another and see. So that's the warning. And if they don't take the warning and live the way they had been because they were horrible. You think the social problems in our country were great. They were, they were bad in Israel in that day. Taking advantage of the poor, not caring for the people the way God wanted his nation to act. So he warned them, if you don't get it right, I'm going to come with utter destruction. And I believe that destruction is coming in the form of the tribulation. Because they've rejected the Messiah the first time he came, they will be judged during that tribulation. But at the end, given one more time to repent, and there'll be a national repentance. And then it'll take them right into the, the millennial kingdom. So those are the things that we kind of wait for. Um, but, but I want you to see what happened in those years of silence. Have you ever been through 400 years of silence? <laughs> I've not been through 400 years of anything. No one lives that long. But the fact is the nation waited and waited and waited and waited. And what happened in 333 BC is Israel fell to the Greeks. I'm not going to go into great amounts of history just to know Alexander the Great conquered the world. And there's great stories about that, but I won't go into them. But he died young. And then his kingdom, all the places he conquered, were divided into at least three different places. To the north, the Syrians were put in charge, what became the Syrians, the Seleucids, I think. And to the south, Egypt, one of the most ancient countries still in existence today. So Egypt was to the south, Syria was to the north, and then in 323, Israel was conquered by Egypt. I think Syria was supposed to be in charge, Egypt conquered. And that had its own problems, but then uh, in 204 BC, Syria conquered again. And from 204 for I don't know how many years, uh, at one point during their uh, being in charge, they desecrated the temple. It's called the abomination of desolation. Daniel prophesied it. It's going to happen again in the tribulation when the Antichrist does the same thing. But this ruler, Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, 
desecrated the temple, slaughtered a pig in the temple. And he was in charge there for a while, but finally Israel rose up and kicked them out of the temple area. They didn't get their full uh, independence from that, but they at least cleansed the temple. And that's what they celebrate, that's what the Jews celebrated at Hanukkah. Because as they wanted to cleanse the temple, they didn't have enough oil, and it took eight days or so to, to purify the right oil that would be burnt. They took what little they had, and they started burning it, and it lasted, and it lasted, and it lasted, and it lasted. A miracle of God. Even in the midst of the silent years, God was working. So we see, they felt the, Israel fell to the Greeks, Israel fell to the Egyptians, Israel fell to the Syrians. Well, great, the Romans are finally going to step in and set things up right because they were going to be in charge. They hated the Romans. Why did they hate the Romans? Because they installed Herod the Great over them. Herod the Great was a child of Esau. Remember when we studied it, uh, Isaiah? God had unique times of judgment coming for the nation of Edom, the children of Esau. They hated Herod the Great. He was not their king. They wanted no part of it. But the Romans said, he's your king. You listen to the Romans or you die. So he was there. But then Thursday night, went to see Christmas was the Chosen in the movie theaters. And one of the things I had not heard about so clearly, one of the monologues talked about, as they were waiting, as they were struggling, they started to break up into great big factions. There were two great factions of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but there were plenty of others, the Essenes, the, there were so many groups of people, and they kind of ate themselves alive as they opposed one another. Does that sound like anything you can relate to today? If you're waiting for peace on earth to come, it's not going to come through politics. And for each of these groups that are waiting, I want to make a statement. I am not waiting for political answers to our problems. I will pray for our, my government leaders. I will pray that they do wise, wise things, but when they don't do wise things, I have someone else I'm waiting upon. I'm not putting my hope in politics. Not only was the nation waiting, but then of course we see Zechariah was waiting. Look at the middle part of verse five. There was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. Abijah. <laughs> Jump over to eight, verse eight. Now when he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. I'm sure I've heard how often this may have happened. It might have been the only time he ever had a chance to do that. I've heard that said. I don't know if that's totally true, but I've heard it said. He was waiting. When I see the things, what's he waiting for? Well, when he was served, it was his job, when he was called to serve, to go in and offer incense on the altar of incense, which was just outside of the Holy of Holies, that only one person would enter once a year. It was the place under Moses where God resided. And when he was in there to offer the incense, which represents prayer, it was basically a priestly prayer, the people outside were praying, may the merciful God enter the holy place and accept with favor the offering of his people, the prayers of his people. I am so thankful that I don't have to pray through a priest. I am so thankful that I have one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that he has given his Holy Spirit, that even when I am struggling with what to talk to him about, the Holy Spirit will pray. I'm not waiting for priests. Not only do we see priestly prayer, we see his priestly duties. I've already said that he, he entered and, and offered the incense and, and that whole picture. He also had his own personal sadness. We'll see in a moment why, in conjunction with Elizabeth, but there without a child. And as hard as that was for the woman, it was also hard for the man. In fact, he probably walked around, why am I being judged by being childless? And his wife would have asked the same thing, if you remember Matthew's testimony. What's wrong with me? Something must be wrong with me. So there's this priestly prayer, these priestly duties, the, priest, the personal sadness. I want to just say this. I'm not waiting for religious answers to our problems. Because religion alone is empty. I'm not, relating, I'm not waiting for political answers. I'm not waiting for religious answers. 
Now let's move to see Elizabeth at her wedding. Last part of verse 5. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, a Levite, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. The first thing we see here is a personal righteousness. You know, that's a dangerous thing, personal righteousness. Because compared to other people, they were very righteous. Compared to God's holy standard, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if you think you have enough righteousness to have a relationship with God, you're probably to be more pitied than the person that recognizes their sin. Because you all know you need a Savior. I think I'm doing fine by myself. So the personal righteousness is a, is a cause for concern there. The personal sadness, they are without child. And, and I think about so much depression in the world right now. We have the good news, and we should go tell it on the mountain. We should share the source of our good news with people, because they're looking for something to hope in. So this family didn't have a child. They were hoping for a child. Why were they hoping for a child? Maybe he'll be the Messiah. Well, they weren't going to get that, but they were going to get something pretty awesome. And we also see a personal decline, a weakness. That's old age, folks. You all, anybody old know what I'm talking about there. <laughs> the things that you had in life that you thought that you could do, and you start to see, I can't do that anymore. I can't find the words like I used to. I'm, I'm searching them. I know I know that word. I can't find it. Or probably one of the things that leads to depression, if you think about all the things that I thought I was going to do with my life. And then you realize that many of them were blocked. So then what do we come up with? Well, let, let's have a bucket list. I'm going to die sometime. I'm going to get some of these things done. See, there's many reasons for struggle there. A personal righteousness, not good enough. Personal sadness is real. A personal weakness or personal decline. Let me say this. I'm not waiting to get my act together. Not waiting to get my act together. Thank the Lord he does not. That lie keeps more people from Christ than many others. Well, you can't go to church. You can't go to you gotta get your act together. And then you can come. I think next week you might hear a song, and I'm not sure if we have it in the schedule perfectly yet, but the song that we kind of told you about when we weren't meeting, we said it out many times. Oh come all you unfaithful. The unfaithful are invited because God is faithful and he has welcomed you. Christ is born for you and we need to hold on to that. So I am not waiting for political answers. I'm not waiting for religious answers. I am not waiting to get my act together. The next group that we see waiting, and I'll call it the group, although we only introduced the one, angels waiting. What does that mean? Why do I see angels waiting? Well, Gabriel's going to appear, verse 11, Luke 1, 11. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. The angels are also very aware of this silent time. The purpose of angels were what? To be messengers. And God said, not for a while. Nothing to share with creation for a while. You'll be silent as far as the creation is concerned. And I ask at the 9 o'clock hour we were talking about, you know, do you believe there are angels with us right now? And they could appear in a second, in a moment. Angels are not everywhere present, but God has them where he wants them. And I remember studying with a guy in my office, and I said, what do you think about angels? Do you think they're here? He said, yeah, they're in the corner laughing at us because we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> and, and just to, to know that, to, to think about the angels, they're waiting to appear. Why do they want to appear? Look at verse 12. And, Zach, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, great words in the Bible, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Waiting to encourage. The angels know the glory of God's presence, and they know that we are made, meant for God's presence, but we live in this sin-cursed world. And they want to come and encourage, because that's what God wants them to do. To give us a message of encouragement. Give us courage instead of the fear. 
Love casts out fear. It encourages us. And he does encourage Zechariah. Look at the, the next part of verse 13. For your prayers have been heard. What we're going to hear now, they were waiting to announce. They were waiting to appear, waiting to encourage, waiting to announce. Listen to the announcement. Has been heard, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, in turn to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I don't think this is Malachi's prophecy in full, because John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah with the same purpose, but Elijah will come before the, 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 the day of the Lord, or at the day of the Lord. He will show to, to call the people. I believe he's one of those two prophets that will be preaching outside of the temple. So, so understand that John the Baptist is going to be a one who comes in the spirit of Elijah. Again, telling people, get your families together. That's why we're excited about hiring somebody to be a family pastor, to work with our children and youth and to, to help us do better as a church in that area. We, we need to know how important that is. We're so subdivided. We need to find hope, healing and, and hope in our families and then share it with one another. So they're waiting to give this announcement. There's one other thing that they're waiting for, waiting for faith. The angels know that God is pleased with faith. I don't know what God's presence is like when we act in a faithless manner. I don't know how he would, how, whether they could see his response, but they know from the truth, God is pleased with faith. So what happens in verses 18 through 20? And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife has advanced in years. And the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel. <laughs> I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Did God give Gabriel a Gabriel a heads up? He's not going to believe you. This is what you're supposed to do. Or was he so in tune with God, he knew right away what he was supposed to do. But it's just that, remember when God called Jeremiah, I'm going to send you to the people, they're not going to listen. Just know up front, they're not going to listen. So the angels know. Oh, the faithlessness of God's creation when we're not being moved by the Spirit to, to believe. They were waiting for faith to grow again in the world. Think how excited they were at the day of Pentecost when all those people got saved. All the things that they watched and it, it just displayed for them God, the one that they served. And again, obviously, I'm not talking about any fallen angel now. They watched and they see his plan unfolding. Waiting to appear, waiting to encourage, waiting to announce, and waiting for faith. But you know what? Even though it's Christmas time and we hear a lot about angels, I'm not waiting for angels. Uh, I, I was talking again at the 9 o'clock hour and someone said, Hey, Pastor, just want you to know we turned off Hallmark and decided to watch It's a Wonderful Life. And I said, Well, they, you know, some of those Hallmark movies with the angels, they don't really like those. They don't have a lot of good things to, to really say about what angels are really about. Well, neither does a, it's a wonderful life. Sorry, Clarence is not my picture of an angel. <laughs> but regardless, I'm not waiting for angels. I'm glad there's one on our tree, but I'm not waiting for them. I'm waiting for the God that they serve. I'm waiting upon the God of glory, the most high God. And that's the picture we have. There's one other group that I want to point out here. Worshippers waiting. Worshippers waiting. Verse 10, go back to verse 10 for a second. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. That's where Zechariah is serving. There's a whole group of people there. And what are they doing? They're focused on the incense, which represented their prayer. They are waiting in prayer. When you wait, that's the best way to wait, to wait in prayer. 
Oh, it's hard to pray for long. Well, just keep talking to God about it and see what happens. Waiting in prayer. Look at verse 21 of Luke chapter 1. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. Now, don't laugh when this one comes up. Waiting for the service to end. <laughs> I told you not to laugh. <laughs> Waiting for the service to end. He's inside. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going on. But they're, they're gonna, we're, we're, we're supposed to stay here until he comes out. What's going on? And this I don't even know if the, the, the times when the, the one person, the one the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, they, they say that they put a rope around him in case he did it in a way that got him dead and they drag him back out. I don't think they, they did that here. They just... What's going on? Why is this taking so long? Look at verses 22 through 23. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making his signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. The worshipers were waiting for an explanation. He couldn't give it. I don't know how much he wrote and tried to tell them. I'm sure they watched. I don't know how long he stayed, but I'm sure they watched. I wonder if Zachariah is going to speak today. I wonder. If, I wonder. I wonder. Oh, Zachariah is leaving today. Still no explanation. What happened? Do you like explanations when you're going through a hard time? If you went to see Esther, they said I went. I, I just love Mordecai. It happened two, maybe three times. He just raised his hand and said, "Why?" That's how we feel. When you worship God, you wait in prayer. You wait to see if, if this challenge is going to end. You wait for an explanation. But God determines if he's going to grant them. Really what we're waiting for is salvation. We're waiting for salvation. As I was working on this message, someone stopped by my office and said they found some old letters that were written by family members. And... It was from an uncle that lived during the time of the Depression and had gone out to Colorado to work at a ranch to make money, to, make, to, to live life. And in this letter, he wrote to the family and made all the connections and said, and said I was just the other day kind of lonelier. I, I picked up my Bible and read through Romans 6 and got to the end of that chapter where it says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And that verse God used to call him to salvation. And his life changed after that. I think about Matthew's testimony. Didn't understand why he lost all that weight. Why was he being bullied? All the problems he was having. And a friend invited him. And he heard about a good, good father. We don't sing the song Oceans if you've ever heard it. It's, I will keep my eyes above the waves where oceans rise and I'll look at you. He heard those two songs and Jesus saved his soul. See, everybody is worshiping something. We think of worshipers as the people gathered here today, but everybody's worshiping something. And what they're really looking for is salvation. But they're looking in the wrong places and not finding it. And God will interrupt your life when he wants to call you. And he'll get your attention. So, one of the, I'm just going to sum this up. It got a little bit, and my mind went every which direction. But I'm not waiting for my own worship preferences. When we think about worship, well, I want to go to the church that does it the way I want them to do it. Are you looking for God or are you looking for what you want? And that's just a challenge. Now, there are many, there are liturgical churches. I grew up in one, and there are people that have been here and said, I prefer a, a, a deeper liturgy. I, I like this, the, the stability of that. You know, some of the, some churches are just too wide open for me. Well, we're, I think we usually find a, a middle ground. I mean, there are charismatic churches. You never know what you're going to get. I remember one family moved away from here, and I said, hey, how's the music over there? I said, I've learned that if I don't like it this week, I'll like it next week, because they change it all the time. But, but the fact is, I'm not waiting for my preferences. I'm not waiting for my plan. At one point I had written in here, I'm not waiting for my eschatological plan to be fulfilled. Because we study the end times. It's okay, I'm waiting for you to do what I think you should do next. 
I'm waiting for God. And he's going to trump my plan and my understanding. And I have to accept that. So I'm not waiting for political answers. I'm not waiting for religious answers. I'm not waiting to get my act together. I'm not waiting for angels. And I'm not waiting for my worship preferences. I'm waiting upon the Lord. The conclusion is while we wait upon God, life goes on. Waiting doesn't mean sitting at home. I think too many people that are really struggling with COVID feel like all I can do is sit at home and try not to get sick. Pray for them. Because they, are they waiting for the wrong thing? It's, it's, it's okay to protect yourself, but you have to get on and live life. You have to get on and engage with people again. God gives us community for a reason. So while we wait upon God, life goes on. We see, and I'm not going to read through these passages. It's just going to, to, to uh, make these statements. God is still giving life. Elizabeth had a child. She praised the God. She praised her father for the gift of that child. God is still giving life. And I'm not just talking about babies being born. I'm talking about salvation coming. I'm talking about lives being changed. People being called back from their backslidden condition. God is still giving life. Physical and spiritual. Life goes on. And then... After the baby was born, on the eighth day, it says in verse 59, they came to circumcise the child. Why? Because they were walking in obedience. And when the, the people said, let's not call him John, that's ridiculous. Let's call him Zachariah. No, his name is John. So God is still giving life. God is still looking for our obedience. It's not going to be perfect obedience. You're not getting your act together. Just what is he telling you to do? Respond to it and see what he will do in your life. And then the rest of the chapter, verse 64, and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. Challenge you sometime this week, read the rest of the chapter. Read the rest of the chapter and see what he praises God for. Because God is still worthy of our praise. God is still calling us to worship and know him. I hope this is encouraging. We want hope. Hope is going to grow as we wait upon God by faith. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing not a Christ Christmas hymn. Matter of fact, we sang this song two weeks ago, but it's the only hymn I could bring myself to sing after this message. Great is thy faithfulness. It ties in with the book of Lamentations. It ties in with the verse that we read for the call to worship. It actually follows that verse. So we're going to sing this hymn because the only way we can hope to grow in faith is because of the faithful one we serve. So let me bow in prayer, and we will sing this closing hymn, and then I'll pronounce the benediction. Father, I praise you. I praise you for the, the Christmas season and all the things that we're seeking to get done. Give us great wisdom. Help us to find that elusive, it, it's actually impossible. I don't know why I pray for it. Balance. Help us to find you, and you will help us keep the balance that you want us to have. I thank you, Father. I thank you for the awesome stories that accompany this Christmas season. And I pray that you would bless us to know you better because of your faithful work in our lives. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
And God our Father, who has loved us and give us, given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen our hearts in every good work and word as we wait upon him. Amen.